Water is essential to the existence of all life on Earth. Yet water is finite. We will never have any more than we have now. And in fact, fresh water that humans and other species depend on is only 1% of the world's water resources. Human populations are rising. The need for water is rising. We already use over 50% of the world's surface water resources, and that is expected to rise to 70% in the next 20 years. As PUB, we are the National Water Agency of Singapore, and we are responsible for ensuring that Singapore will always have safe, adequate, sustainable supply of water in a very cost-effective way to all our citizens, uh, even as Singapore continues to grow. We are striving to be a city of gardens and water. Singapore is a small, compact and highly urbanized city-state with very limited water resources. A good exhibition or program on water will help to inculcate this sense of value for water, help to demonstrate the constraints that we face as a nation, and also how far we have come in overcoming these constraints. The Lake Calumet area by itself is very important for biodiversity. It, we have lost a tremendous amount of our wetlands throughout the country, but in Illinois, the estimates are something on the order of 90% of the wetlands that were here 100 years ago are gone. This area has the largest number of threatened and endangered bird species of any area in Illinois. But what really makes this a sort of unique area is the fact that this was the center for the steel industry in this part of the world um, until the 1970s. You've got this important biodiversity in an area that is also being used by man, and so you have to learn how to get those two parts to live together effectively. I first became interested in Australia's wetlands when I had to work on a species of water bird and I started to think about what it depended on, the habitats that were important to it. And then I got the magnificent opportunity of going across Australia doing aerial surveys, looking at some of these extravagant, if you like, wetlands where you got incredible boom and bust periods and seeing the, the great range of life from the plants to the fish to the water birds. And then in other parts of Australia where we were developing rivers with dams and diverting water, places like the Macquarie Marshes, we were seeing the, 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 the big issues, the big problems. And I guess we're in a real, really interesting position now where we're concentrating on trying to deliver flows back into those areas, but we're also looking at conserving whole river systems. And communities are really engaged in this country, and it is a very exciting time. In recent years, I've become more and more interested in this thing that some ecologists call teleconnections, which is what are the large-scale patterns that define periods of droughts, periods of intense precipitation, and how are different processes in the biosphere connected? You can see it around here, all the dead stubs of previous chaparral that burned in year 2003. This was the result of a very intense El Nino year in 1998. Then the ocean cooled down, and we had a number of very dry years. And in 2003, all the shrubs that had accumulated during the wet years, and they just burned like that. What happens in the desert and what happens in the ocean are very intimately related. So understanding in detail what happens every time you have a dry cycle or a wet cycle is very important to make predictions for many things. Welcome, folks, to the Igniting Streams of Learning and Science Summer Academy funded by the Ohio Board of Regents. We would like to create a, an exciting way of getting students interested in teaching science and interested in doing science. And what we're going to do is to build a curriculum that students help to build that's used in the classrooms that change people's attitudes about the environment. In biomonitoring, we use very simple tools, the same tools that our students are using in the institute. We collect fishes and macroinvertebrates with seines and kick nets. We collect the animals and put them into trays so that we can identify them. We also follow standardized procedures that have us take simple measurements, like the depth of the water or the substrate quality. Is it a pebble, a rock, or a bedrock? I see 7.2 inches. 
We also use laser levels, more sophisticated tools, to look at the way in which the morphology or the shape of the stream varies in different regions of the stream. That tells us whether it's a stable river or not, whether increased water flow is causing erosion or not. We're at Los Alamos National Laboratory here in New Mexico, and uh, I'm standing in front of the linear accelerator right now. We actually look at all sorts of materials on a day-to-day -day basis, but my specialty has been ice and ice-related materials. Ice is a mineral. I don't think a lot of people understand that, but ice has a very regular atomic structure. Even though it's still H2O, it actually can form many different atomic structures or different phases, they call it, uh, depending on where it is. So for example, ice that we see on the surface of the Earth is actually different if you, if you see it in space and that sort of thing. It actually has a very different molecular buildup. As a mineralogist, I'm very interested in how these materials are put together. So as somebody would walk through this exhibit, um, I hope they, they realize that there are many different phases of water from liquid to solid to steam uh, to really understand that water is very important to us every day, but also is very complicated material for scientists to look at and to understand. Estimates of the amount of water in Earth's mantle are based on the results of laboratory experiments carried out at high pressures and high temperatures, conditions similar to those deep inside the Earth combined with observations of rocks that were carried to Earth's surface in volcanic flows. These estimates place the water content in Earth's mantle at one to 10 times the amount of water contained in the oceans as we presently know them today at Earth's surface. And this is possible because the volume of the mantle is really very large compared to the volume of the oceans. So even a very small amount of water contained in each mineral grain inside the Earth would add up very quickly to several times the amount of water in Earth's oceans. As visitors walk through this exhibit, we hope that they have an opportunity to reassess their relationship with water, to not take it for granted and understand that each of us has a role to play in effective management of the world's water systems. Researchers and government officials around the world are providing us with ideas for how we could be better water stewards as individuals, as community members, as business people, and as members of governments.